My name is Melissa Schwartz, and I'm going to be running the webinar. Um, a couple of housekeeping items to go through before I hand it over to Carrie. The first thing is we are going to save some time at the end for questions. So if you have a question for Carrie, please put it in the question box and please do not wait till the end. Uh, myself and one other person is on and we're going to be collecting all the questions. So it's best if you just go ahead and ask your question while Carrie is going through her presentation. Then we will be reading some of those questions out loud for Carrie to answer at the end. We are recording this webinar and a link will go out to everyone who has registered giving you access to the recorded webinar and you also can send that link to other people and encourage them to watch the webinar. So without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to Carrie and she's going to go through the psychology of suffering, how to handle the pain. So Carrie? Awesome. Thanks, Melissa. I'm so, so excited to be here today. And um, and this is one of my favorite topics to talk about with my athletes. So I was, um, you know, when Training Peaks uh, contacted me to maybe do another webinar, I knew exactly what I wanted to do. So welcome, everybody. Uh, my name is Carrie Cheadle. And for those of you who um, who might not be familiar with my work or know what I do, I am a mental skills coach. And I have the unbelievable privilege of working with um, individual athletes and teams and doing training camps all across the country um, with athletes in all different sports but I specialize in working with endurance athletes so that's why that's one of the reasons why I'm so excited to be here with you guys today and talk about this topic um, I'm also author of the book on top of your game mental skills to maximize your athletic performance um, so you know I, I get to work with athletes I, for, at every level, from people who are just, you know, signing up for their very first triathlon or even their first 5K or just trying to figure out how to get a handle on exercise and making it a priority in their life to um, people who are doing this, uh, you know, at an elite and professional level. I get to work with everybody. Um, and, you know, a lot of what I do with mental skills training is to help athletes, well, first to kind of help, help athletes get out of their own way, but also to help you set yourself up for success. So what I'm going to talk about today, it's it's just like one is, you know, you've got all these spokes in the wheel and I'm just, I'm an, another spoke in the wheel and I get to work on, on the mental game. So let's get started. Um, to give you just a little overview of what it is that I'm going to cover today with you guys. Um, we're, I'm going to do just a quick kind of like introduction to pain to give you some background and, and just a, a little synopsis of what, are, what exactly are we talking about? What's the, the backdrop of what we're talking about today? And then I'm going to move into, well, why is it that some of us hold ourselves back from really pushing to that level of suffering that we know that we probably could get to but just don't get to. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about that and then I'm going to go right into what five mental skills training tools that you can use in order to help increase your tolerance and ability to handle a bonus, exciting bonus for you at the end as well. All right, so pain. Pain um, is extremely complex because it's, um, it's a subjective experience and everybody handles pain differently and a lot of that is because we all have different experiences with pain. So you might you know, you might think about other other people in your life, maybe teammates or or your um, your coaches or your athletes, and think, man, there are just some people. Something I really had to work towards, um, and really was able to understand this the psychology piece of it, and what a huge factor that is in our ability to. Um, to tolerate pain. So there's there are a lot of different sort of things in play when we talk about that ability to suffer um, and a lot of different things that that factor into that ability to tolerate that pain. And so you know as athletes and coaches you guys know especially being you know in the sports that you're in you know that the ability to suffer 
or the pain of exertion plays a very big role in endurance sports, both in training and in competition. There's going to be a time where you're going to have to push yourself harder than you think possible. So how do you do it? When you, when you know that you're, that you're capable of more, how do you actually pull that out? of yourself and it's um, it's interesting you know this topic comes up a lot with my athletes because sometimes you you're you feel like you can't quite figure out if what you're I want to talk to just really briefly about what what type of pain we're we're actually talking about. So there's two <laughs> there's two different types of pain, and as an athlete, you've probably experienced both. So there's the pain of injury, like you know max effort, and that and your higher levels of intensity and your higher levels of effort. Um, so in either circumstance, the pain that you feel, pain is a signal. It's a message from your brain telling you that that there's something that you need to pay attention to. So your brain's job is your brain, that's your brain's job, is to make sure you don't cause harm to yourself or further harm to yourself if you're already injured. What's interesting about this idea of, you know, the psychology of suffering and pushing yourself is that you can mediate that pain of suffering by backing off. So it's really, it's a, that's a hard thing to overcome, to override your brain basically and say, no, I can do this. I know it sucks and it hurts, but I can do this and I can keep going and, if, and to make yourself do that. So a lot of the tools I'm going to talk about, you know, tap into that. Like, oh man, when I am pushing and I don't want to push anymore, how do I keep going? That's what we're going to, that's kind of some of the stuff that we're going to cover. You know, I have so many, um, so many athletes that I've worked with, you know, and I'm sure you've probably experienced this at some point too, having that that race where you you get to the end and you're like, man, I had more left in the tank. Like, what happened? Why didn't I Why didn't I push myself harder? And so we're gonna we're gonna cover that piece. Why is it that that you haven't pushed yourself harder? So, you know, a lot of the time we're actually capable of, phys of physically pushing harder than than we do than we realize that we can so so why don't we and there's there's a few different factors in play um, when it comes to this piece when it comes to well why is it that I'm not pushing myself as hard as I can actually go why am I holding back um, or why you know why is that happening and the first you know, I always talk about this when I talk about mental skills training. Is, <laughs> you know, not everything's mental. Sometimes it's physical. So with, you know, sometimes you're not able to push yourself harder because you're actually physically tired. You're incapable of pushing harder. But the other piece with this that's that's even sort of more nuanced and and really kind of intriguing to me is that not only could you be physically tired and that's it. That's actually all you have. That's all you're physically capable of. But when you're really pushing yourself to to that limit, when you're really pushing yourself hard, um, your 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 brain is fatigued as well. So you're not able to make quick decisions, and you might even have a hard time even formulating the thought to push yourself harder. That you would be capable of pushing yourself harder. So I had this actually happen with um, an athlete, one of my athletes recently, where he's a, a collegiate elite a collegiate runner and he you know he was running a race and he was pushing himself and he was he was doing really well and and could you know he was w working to the point where he couldn't formulate the thought that he had anything more in him until externally he got <laughs> feedback from his coach and he heard his coach screaming at him to get the guy in front of them and when he got that he was like oh it kind of it woke him up a little bit and he and he was able to do that but because he was working so hard his brain his brain wasn't even able to formulate that thought of like i can go harder so sometimes fatigue is is the factor one of the other factors is our our expectations and how our expectations play a part in in not pushing as hard as we can go so when you've had a you know previous experience suffering in similar circumstances, you're more likely to 
create a, an automatic thought pattern with that. So if you're, you know, say you're, um, you're in a competition and you're about to hit the climb or one of the climbs and it's a climb you've done before and you know the last time you were on that climb you suffered. So you're thinking about it all the way leading up to the climb. So as soon as you feel anything in your legs, any burning in your legs, your, uh, your brain's automatically going right there. So it's super tuned into that because you were already sort of thinking, oh God, this is going to suck. I don't want to do this. So as soon as you feel that pain, you know, you're in that circumstance with those kinds of expectations, you start to look for what you're expecting. And then that becomes all you can see. You're only going to be tuned into to the suffering piece. Um, so, so expectations play a part. You know, another way I see this play out with my endurance athletes is if you're, um, when you're looking at your data, right, so you're training or you're in competition and you're feeling pretty good and then you look down at your heart rate and you see a number that you think, oh man, I can't keep this up, what am I doing? So that expectation right there keeps you from pushing harder. Um, so so that's kind of a, uh, gives you a snapshot of expectations and how they might play a part. And then the other one, the big one, this is a big one, is fear. So many athletes hold themselves back from pushing as hard as they can go, as you've probably done this at some point, held yourself back from pushing as hard as you can go because of that fear of, well, if I push, if I push too hard now, what if I don't have anything left at the end? What if I burn all my matches? So that fear is one of the biggest things that keeps people from actually knowing how hard they can go. And I've seen entire careers go that route where that athlete never knew how far they could actually push themselves because they were so afraid of pushing too hard and ending up not finishing or ending up finishing at the back of the pack or finishing somewhere that they felt like was not acceptable. So that fear holds a lot of people back. Um, and the, the challenge is you don't know how hard you can go until you push past that. So so that's the risk. There is a risk there of well, you know, of, of figuring out um, you know, you know, and it's it's important to have the data that you have because that is going to inform your decisions. But because there's this mental piece that plays a role in in this idea of being able to tolerate pain, you can't just rely on that. There's, you know, they work in combination with each other. So your both your physical and your mental state have a significant impact on your perception and your experience of pain. So when you've, you know, once you've taken care of the, all of the physical aspects or the physiological aspects that can impact your ability to tolerate pain, so you're, you've got the physical fitness, you're, you're strong, you're not fighting off any, you know, not fighting off a cold, you're not fighting off getting sick, your hydration is dialed in, your, nutri your nutrition is dialed in, when all of these things are dialed in, the physical piece, what's left is that mental piece, and that is a very significant factor in your ability to push yourself to your max effort, to push, to really push yourself when you don't want to push yourself anymore. So any, you know, any type of physical or mental tension is going to increase your feeling of pain. So that's what we're going to get into now: is those those five mental skills training tips to how you know how do we reduce that tension actually both physiologically and psychologically so that you give yourself more space to be able to take in what you're about to take in of that of getting ready to suffer so the first mental skills training tool that you have available to you to help increase your tolerance of pain is just to accept the pain so in the last Training Peaks webinar I did, um, I did it on optimal race prep and I talked about how, you know, the race doesn't start at the start line, it starts when you start thinking about your race, when you start your race prep and the same thing happens with your pain prep. So a lot of, of angst comes from just fighting against the pain of kind of getting to the start line or getting to the beginning of your, you know, maybe you're working on intervals that day. And as you're thinking about it, that fight against, oh God, I don't want, I don't want it to hurt. I know it's going to hurt, and I don't want it to hurt. So a lot of energy is expended in that. So, so the first thing that you can do for yourself in this idea of pain prep is to just accept the pain, 
and not just in, not just accept it, but embrace it, to go in ready for it, to invite it in and say, all right, here I am, I'm ready, I know it's going to hurt, and I love it, and I'm ready to go. So just ex going in accepting that, yes, this is going to hurt, and yes, I am ready for it. That's your first, your first mental skills training tool that you have available to you. So the next one is to have a race goal. So when you have something specific in mind that you are working towards, you're going to be more likely to push yourself to, to accomplish that outcome, to reach that goal. So if your goal is to just finish, then that's what you'll do. Um, and there's nothing wrong with that goal. But if you get to the end of your race and you find that you're disappointed, then you know, oh, okay, there, I, I need to bridge that. So what's, what's happened in that circumstance is you've got your stated goal of, yeah, you know, I'm just happy if I finish with the pack or I'm just going to be elated if I, uh, you know, get to the finish line of this triathlon. And that's your stated goal. But if you get to the end and you're disappointed, that means you had a secret goal in the back of your mind. And your secret goal is the one that you really wanted. And sometimes we don't even know that until we get the end to the end and feel that disappointment, until you get the end and go, oh my God, I had more to give. What happened? Why didn't I push harder? So when you've got that goal, that specific goal in mind, you're more likely to push yourself to get that goal. So this is a challenging one for some athletes too, because for some people, um, you know, sometimes when you have that outcome goal, you, f you feel like it puts more pressure on you to accomplish that goal. So it doesn't just have to be an outcome goal. It doesn't just have to be a time goal. You could have process goals too that you're working on that help you continue to push yourself throughout the race. So it might be, you know, one of your goals might be on this next climb, I want to make sure I'm in the top third of the pack. So then you're thinking about, okay, what does that mean? Where do I need to be in going into the climb? And how do I push myself and make sure I stay um, on that you know, in that top third. So having those kinds of goals can help push you as well. So you, um, you know, just just having that goal sometimes can help you push a little bit harder um, when you're actually in it, when you're actually in it and in, in, in competition or in doing that interval. So the next one is this, this is a really key sort of mental skills training tool, especially when it comes to suffering because of that idea that physical tension and mental tension are going to increase your feelings of pain. So this mental skills duel is relax, relax, relax. Anything you can do to help relax your body and relax your mind as you're in motion. So, you know, I talk a lot about this. I talk a lot about this in my book of, you know, ex athletes that are experiencing pre-performance anxiety and, and getting really nervous going into competition and the tools that you can use to help you know, to help you feel more confident and focused going in. But you need that during the competition too. So especially when it comes to suffering. So making sure that you're checking in with yourself and doing sort of a, a little a quick check in of like, okay, am I breathing? Am I relaxed? So one of the one of the tools I use with almost all of my endurance athletes that's super simple that you can do, you know, you know whether you're running or on the bike or no matter what you're doing, it's a tool that you always have with you. And it's just a quick mantra that you can use to help trigger that relaxation response. So, and you can actually try it right now. So wherever you are, sitting in front of your computer, learning about how to suffer. <laughs> so right now, just taking a nice big deep breath and say to yourself, relax my hands, relax my face, and breathe. Relax my hands, relax my face, breathe. So as soon as you do that, for some of you, as soon as you do that, it sends a little message to the rest of your body to relax as well. So it's a quick way to be able to relax any physical tension that has come with um, eliciting your stress response. So sometimes we increase our feeling um, of that tension when we um, get fearful of the pain that we're going to be encountering as well. So you're helping relax that. Uh, and so for some of you, you might have noticed too, you know, sometimes as soon as you do that, like relax my hands, relax my face, breathe, 
you get this message that goes to the rest of your body and sometimes the next thing that happens is that your shoulders drop and maybe you breathe a little bit deeper or a little bit slower because your brain has just told your body, whoa, chill out, we're cool, it's okay, everything's fine, we can handle this. So it's just a super quick, this is how you can relax while you're in motion. If you found that it was that was hard and that you, you weren't able to achieve any kind of <laughs> relaxation just sitting here, then that's you need to work on your relaxation response, which is the response that counters your stress response. So if you find that that's um, a, something that you need to work on, you know, it's just like a muscle. It, you know, we're we're really good in our daily lives of <laughs> of contracting our our um, stress response, but we don't work on the relaxation response. And you need it's it's a response that has to be strengthened. So if you find that you're that you weren't able to get you like feel any relaxation doing that. Then there's um, actually you can go to my, my on my website. There's a um, there's a tab that says worksheets, and on there there's um, it's the worksheets that come with the book. But you and all the worksheets are free. There's a bunch of free downloads on there, and um, uh, in the chapter that's relax your body, there's two audio files on there, and one's a breathing exercise and one's progressive relaxation. So if you find that you're not able to relax just saying this mantra, go practice. Go you know, and there's all kinds of apps out there for that kind of stuff too. But that's a response you want to be able to. It's a skill. So in order for you to really be able to feel it while you're in the midst of suffering, you gotta you you gotta work on that skill. So anything you can do to help yourself relax while you're in motion. So the next one we're going to talk about, and we're going to just um, spend a little bit more time here because this is a big one. This is um, for this mental skills training tool in terms of suffering. This one has to do with choosing your focus, and there's a, so there's a few different things we're going to touch on here. Um, so I'm sure you've probably <laughs> noticed that as soon as you start thinking about how much pain you're in, that's all you can think about. So your mind is now super tuned in and super focused on the pain that you're feeling. So, you know, there's certain techniques that are going to work if you're just experiencing, you know, like a, a lower, um, almost a mundane sort of feeling of discomfort with what you're doing. Like you're just, it kind of hurts and you don't want to do it anymore. There's certain things that you can do to help you get through, you know, to focus and help you get through that. But when you're at your limit physically, there's there's some techniques that are not going to be as effective in that situation. So we're going to talk, you know, we're going to touch on, on some of both. So the first thing here is, um, and this is big with um, with endurance athletes, and there's a lot of research that kind of goes into this type of focus. So looking at association versus disassociation. So is it better to tune into the pain and really focus on the pain, or is it better to disassociate from it or distract yourself? Um, and you know, when you're at your limit, there there's no way you can distract yourself from the pain that you're feeling. Um, however, there is you know where. It, because our experience of pain is a continuum, um, you, this is going to be different for everybody. So there's going to be times where distraction might be a great tool. Um, so some of the different things that, that athletes ha use that have been effective for them um, are music. And so, you know, I know not, I actually am one of those people that I don't, I don't like training with music. Um, I don't like running with music. It, it just, to me, it ends up being a distraction and something that I don't, I don't use. So, so music might not be the one for you. However, there are some times when I use music um, in a little bit in a little bit different way. And when you're really hurting and needing to get through something, sometimes the distraction of um, you know of listening to music or even singing to yourself—that's the one I do, sing to myself. <laughs> so um, it can be a really powerful um, way to get through something that you don't want to get through is having that kind of distraction. So using music, utilizing imagery. I had an athlete I was working with. He was a, um, a pro cyclist, and he would on climbs he would imagine uh, that his body was a machine, and so he sort of separated himself from the emotion of what he was feeling and just imagined like how his legs were moving as as a machine and sort of had this really powerful visual um, image so for some people if you're more of a visual thinker using imagery in some way might be more effective for you um, and then I had an athlete I was doing a workshop um, for the San Francisco Marathon 
a, a couple years ago, and it was all about like optimal, you know, race prep and and getting confident for the for the marathon. And this um, one of the gentlemen in the workshop said he one of the things he does to help distract him is that as he's passing people or more likely being passed, that was those were his words. <laughs> he would make up stories about the people that were around him. So he, you know, look around and be like, you know, just wondering sort of what they did last night and what their profession was and what they had for breakfast. And he would just create these stories. And he's like, and then all of a sudden five miles went by. So, you know, you can create there's all different things you can do for disassociation. And sometimes that can it really can be a powerful tool for sort of forgetting what you're doing and, and taking your mind somewhere else. So when it gets tougher, you know, moving to the next one, when it gets tougher, this might be, you know, for uh, one of the more effective techniques in that situation. So for, for many people, when you're pushing really hard, um, rhythmic cognitive behavior is the, is the technique for you. So that's, you know, fancy talk for having some sort of repetitive mantra that you're saying to yourself. So with this one it could be you say the same word over and over and over um, and just continue to say that that word as you're moving forward. Or for other people they'll count their um, pedal strokes or they'll count their um, steps. So for me that's a big one. that I use this one a lot um, when I'm running and it's I, I usually count to eight and just keep doing that over and over. So I count my steps and I count to eight and I just do that until I get through the pain that I'm um, feeling in that moment. So when you're when you're really hurting it, it's a um, you know it's a different type of distraction. You're sort of you're still tuned in to the feeling of of pain because you can't not be tuned into it at that point. So sometimes, you know, when I'm really there's nothing else that's working for me. That's the one I'm counting my steps. Um, so rhythmic cognitive behavior is a powerful tool for that. Another one, the next one is um, establishing an end. So your brain needs to know that there's a finite timeline to the pain that you're experiencing. So when you're when you know that you're more likely to be able to sustain the effort that you're putting out. And so th with this one there's a few different things you can do with establishing an end. Um, one that um, that I've had a lot of athletes do and works well for me as well is just picking out the next marker. Right? So sometimes it can become very overwhelming <laughs> to our our brain to think oh my god I have 10 more miles how am I going to do this so in that circumstance it becomes too overwhelming to think about how much time is left or how you know how much longer I have to be putting out this effort so if you shorten that time it's something more manageable for your brain to handle so in this way establishing an end means I'm just running to the next tree I'm going to run to that next tree or whatever the marker is I'm going to run to the next sign and then I'm going to pass the sign, I'm going to take a deep breath, and I'm going to choose the next marker. So each time, so in your mind, you've, you've shortened that distance and made it something that's more manageable and made it something that feels like you are more in control of what's happening. So that perception of control is, is a big piece there. So that's one example of establishing an end. Another one is, um, for some people, it works to establish a time end. So, you know, if you're in the the final sprint of you know of a crit it, establishing that just two more minutes I can do anything for two minutes I can do anything for two minutes so for some people they establish the end with the, the with the time frame um, and then um, another one is it, it's a little bit different but it establishes an end by having a mantra of every step gets me closer so when you say that or something like that, every step gets me closer, your brain gives yourself the message that this isn't going to happen forever. <laughs> I won't be feeling this pain forever. So that's what you're basically trying to do in that, in that situation. Now, one of the things that's challenging with this and kind of taps back into that idea of expectations and suffering is that sometimes if you, know, you really want to you want to be smart with this one because I don't know if you've ever had the experience of like you're on you know if you're say you're on a climb and you see the top of the climb and you're like oh my god okay I can do it I can do it I can get there I can get there and you get to the top of the climb and then you realize it keeps going <laughs> and suddenly you're like oh my god I can't I, and you just you automatically slow down it's because in your mind your brain set the expectation of I have enough to go here but I didn't 
I don't know if I have enough to go there because we didn't set that expectation. So you, you want to make sure you know what the end is um, or that you also have tools to be resilient when that happens. And that comes into the next one, which is critical moments. This one I use with almost every athlete that I work with. So critical moments, no matter what, you know, what your sport is, what level athlete you are, there are going to be these moments in your race or even in, in a, you know, in a workout that become, you know, there are these critical moments where it becomes very imperative for you to get through that moment successfully in order to maintain your confidence and focus moving forward. So if we're, we make it specific to this topic of suffering, you want to prepare now for what is to come. So you want to think about the moments in your race where you feel like you're likely to be feeling that pain of your effort and choose what you need to do in that moment. So you're basically eliminating, uh, you're shortening the reaction time of your response to that by planning for that ahead of time. So, um, so one that comes up for <laughs> one that comes up for some of my um, cyclists is like, you know, you you could be, you know, on a cl I know I use climbing a lot because you know people suffer on climbs, <laughs> but you, so you're on a climb, right? And you're feeling amazing and you're riding and it's like, man, I feel pretty good and I think this is the fastest I've ever, you know, you could still be in the middle of the climb and you're like, I, I might get a PR on this climb, like I feel really great and all of a sudden somebody passes you and it looks like they're not even breathing and all of a sudden in one second you're like, oh my god, I, should, I don't even know why I ride a bike, I should probably quit my sport, I'd like to throw this bike off the mountain, this is horrible, like you go from feeling amazing and one second later to feeling awful and feeling like you're a fraud and you shouldn't even be out there. So <laughs> that is a critical moment. So you want to know in that situation, all right, when I'm on a climb and I'm feeling good and I get past, what do I need to think in that moment in order to maintain my focus and my confidence and just ride my pace and, ri and race my race. So that's just one example of a critical moment. So ha planning that ahead of time is going to make it more likely that that's going to be the response that you go to instead of, um, you know, maybe what the automatic thought pattern was of, f of feeling where you usually go to when you feel that experience of suffering. So. Um, and there's actually a, uh, a, one of the uh, on the worksheets on my website. There's a critical moment worksheet. I think it's in the focus. I should totally know this. I think it's in the focus chapter. Um, and it's a uh, but you, it's a free worksheet. It's called critical moments. You can find it on there. And that it you know it just gives you the space to look at. Here's the critical moment, and this is what I need to do in that situation in order to get through that moment successfully and keep pushing myself. So. That, so that's focus. You know, focus is such a huge piece in in this when it comes to suffering, because the because of that experience of you know the more the more you tune into the suffering, the more you feel the suffering. So you gotta know well, what are my other options? Where else could I focus so that um, I, that isn't all consuming, and that you can kind of go back and forth? Because there's going to be times where it is consuming. That's just it. That's part of racing. That's part of competition. That's part of pushing ourselves to our potential. That's going to be part of your experience. Um, and sometimes you just need a break from, from that being part of your experience. And that's what all these tools are for. So the last one, and this is a big one too, but the last mental skill, the fifth mental skills training tool in here is in, if you can in some way shift your perception of the pain that you're experiencing. So your perception of pain plays a very big role in your pain tolerance. So if you decide that the pain is awful and bordering on unbearable, your experience and tolerance will be different than if your perception of it is more positive. So working towards figuring out, you know, this kind of ties back into that, the first mental skills training tool of well, how can I not just, you know, accept the pain, well, and sometimes that's all you can do is just accept the pain, but, but if there's a way for you to shift to actually embracing the pain and knowing that that is a part of your experience and I'm in that feeling that pain means that I'm working to my potential. It means that I'm lucky enough to be able to push my body to its limits. You know, if you can shift your perception, if 
that is going to have a profound impact in, on your ability to tolerate the pain that you're experiencing in that moment. So, you know, again, like if you, if all your associations of pain is that it's negative, then of course it's going to be miserable and you probably aren't going to want to get out there. Um, so this, you know, and this one is something that you can practice a little bit too. So you, you know, you get good at what you practice. So you, while, while you're training, you want to take opportunities um, to work on this and to push yourself past your how comfortable, like, like if you're in a training, you know, sometimes just pushing yourself even 30 seconds, 30 seconds more than, um, than what you had planned to do. So if you're doing an interval and you have a timed interval and you're going to a certain time and you just push 15 seconds more even, your brain is giving your body that message of sometimes I have more in me than I think. Sometimes I can push harder than the limit that I put on something. So you, you can actually practice this and you can practice kind of, you know, you're, you're pushing against the, the, the boundaries that you had of yourself of what you were capable of. So taking opportunities to do that, taking opportunities to run a little bit further further than what when you wanted to stop is a way to um, to practice this and to start embracing the pain a little bit more and literally a way for your you know you to build those neural pathways in your brain of oh sometimes I can push harder than I think and that's an important message when it comes to endurance sports and um, you know if you <laughs> if you're finding that you, you just can't make it positive there's no way for you to make the pain positive sometimes it helps to to um, to know that everybody's suffering even if it appears that they're not <laughs> they are suffering um, you know that's for some people that's their um, everybody carries suffering a little bit different as far as their um, how how you see it manifest externally on their face some people have a great pain face for or, or a, a great poker face and some people have a great pain face so some people have a great poker face when it comes to suffering you're not going to see it you're not going to see it externally but that doesn't mean that they're hurt they're not hurting so sometimes for some people that can help just knowing like I'm not the only one that's working here everybody's working um, so let's you know let's keep moving forward but you know, you know, t touching on that are um, there's some really amazing and compelling research on body language and the messages that it sends to your brain, basically with the different body, you know, with the body language we have. So if you do find that you're one of those people that has a great pain face and you like everybody needs to see how much pain you're in, that actually um, takes energy to have that and it also sends a message to your brain as well so just our facial gestures you know we're, we're so hardwired in that way that you know that there's certain hormones that are getting released depending on what facial gesture you're making with your face and there's immediate sort of emotions that are connected to that so think about that you know when you're when you're you're suffering that you just by changing your the expression on your face put a big fat smile on your face it's going to change what's happening physiologically with your hormones as well so um, you know and if, if all else fails I humor is a fantastic tool it should be a fantastic tool in your toolbox as well so I had one <laughs> I had one athlete that just hated climbing she she was a professional cyclist hated climbing hated climbing and the only thing that, that that really she was able to embrace and that worked for her was that she just did the exact opposite of what she was feeling. So she, when a climb was coming, she would just say, I am so stoked that there's a climb coming because there is nothing I would rather be doing right now than climbing. And I really wish that all of my races were just climbs, no descents, no flats, just climbing, just I want an all climbing race. So she would just go to the exact opposite of what she was feeling. And it just for her provided enough levity for her to relax about it a little bit. So sometimes you could just go to the exact opposite and use a little bit of humor to help relax yourself a little bit. So. This is one of my all-time favorite quotes. I've been sharing it with a lot of the teams that I've been working with lately. So I wanted to, I thought it would be a great, a great quote um, to share with you guys. So the quote says, the road is made by people walking on it. Things are so because they are called so. What makes them so? Making them so makes them so. What makes them not so? Making them not so makes them not so. 
So, so one of the things I talk about in my book is is resilience and how we get to choose how we want to view the situation that's in front of us. And that's exactly what this quote sort of speaks to. So if you decide it's hard, then it's hard. If you call something impossible, then it's impossible. So you get to not just choose which road you want to take. Is it going to be possible or is it going to be impossible? Is it going to be hard or is it going to be a challenge or an opportunity? So you don't just get to choose the road, but you get to pave the road. You get to create the road. So whichever one road you walk down, it, that's the road that you've created. Is So when, when it comes to this idea of um, of suffering, you get to choose which road and you get to pave which road. If you feel like there is no road to choose, then you create it, then you pave it yourself. So it's, you know, it kind of comes back to some of those reasons why we hold ourselves back. Sometimes it comes down to which road we created for ourselves. So th this hopefully gives you some, some ideas of, of different things you can try out to see um, well, what's going to work for me and what's one thing I can take? So that'll be my, that's your, I love giving homework. So your homework, <laughs> you, you didn't know you're going to get homework, but you're totally getting homework. Your homework is going to be to take one of these things and go try it. Try it this week. Try it, you know, whether you're, you're competing or you're training, just pick one thing and try it out and see how it works for you. And one of the other sort of key things when it comes to suffering is that you really have to have a lot of tools in your toolbox. So what you know, we all kind of come with our own operating manual and we all work a little bit differently. And so the things that Times what worked for you 10 minutes ago might not work for you right now. So you you really need to make sure you have a lot of different tools in your toolbox. So that's why I'm you know <laughs> throwing all this stuff at you and giving you a lot of stuff because you you need it when it comes to the you know really pushing yourself to that limit. You you're you're gonna need a lot of different tools to be able to grab from. You want to have a lot of different tools in your toolbox so that you immediately have something when you're like okay that's not working. What else do I have? And you can go right to it. But you got to practice. You gotta, you know, you gotta, you gotta use these things and practice them. Oh, if I have more to give, I just don't. I, I cannot tell if it is physical or mental. Um, this, you know, I feel like I'm at my limit, but I, I'm just not sure. You could just, in that moment, ask yourself, can I give? just 1% more. So not 10%, not 5%, but do, can I, is there any way for me to give 1% more? And if you feel like you can't give 1% more, then you're actually at your limit. That's it. You're at your physical limit for that moment in time. Um, but most of the time, we are not pushing ourselves as hard as we can actually go. Um, unless it's something that you've really practiced and then you can get to that point where you do really know like nope that's it that's all I have this is it this is I'm giving everything right now but if you've ever experienced that feeling of God I ha I keep I'm you know I'm not I'm not tired I could go I could go out and do another run right now and I just finished my race then you know some of these tools might be something that you can play with and, and try out and see if it, it gets you to the finish line feeling like that was it. That was everything I had and, and feel good about that. Um, so to kind of wrap up um, a little bit and then we'll get into some Q&A stuff, you know, I, I always like to, you know, just make sure people know it's not always mental, right, especially when it comes to this. There's a lot of different factors in play. So it, you know, Working on this stuff, on the, the sort of psychology of suffering and the mental piece, it's going to help you, but it's not going to replace the, you know, if you're suffering and you're suffering because you're not, your physical fitness isn't there, it's not going to replace that. It's going to help you push yourself to, the, you know, through that next level, wherever that level is, but sometimes it's not mental. Sometimes it was that you weren't hydrated enough that day, you know, so, so kind of, you know, it's, 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 again, it's, it's one of the, it's one of the spokes in the wheel. So um, you have the opportunity to set yourself up for success. So you know it's um, you you wouldn't go into competition without having worked on 
on your training. You wouldn't go into competition having not done any of your workouts. So why would you go into competition not working on this mental piece? This helps you set yourself up for success. So you don't want to, you know, it helps you be able to experience the fruits of your labor. You work so hard. You spend a tremendous amount of money and time and effort on your training. You want to be able to enjoy the day of and know that you did everything that you could um, and to really push yourself and feel that accomplishment. And the mental game is a, is a part of that. It's just another part of that. So set yourself up to be successful. And know that suffering is a, a part of the reward. So I'm making the assumption that most of you guys are endurance athletes out there. You wouldn't have chosen endurance sports if you weren't in some way, you, if you didn't know that that was going to be a piece of it. Maybe you didn't when you first started, but you sure do now. <laughs> but suffering is part of it. That that, and really when you can embrace that idea that like, that you, you don't want a race paved in gold. Um, you know, if you get that every once in a while, it's amazing, and it's inc an incredible feeling. When you're like, there, there's just nothing I couldn't have done that day. It all came together, and it felt incredible. A lot of us are working for that. When you get that, it's in amazing. Most of the time, there's going to be suffering that's a part of it, and overcoming challenges is one of the most rewarding parts of, of being an endurance athlete. So suffering is a part of it. Suffering is a part of the reward of accomplishing that goal that you worked towards. So uh, before we get into the Q&A, if you uh, dig this mental skills training stuff, I have got so many awesome tools for you on my website. And I've got, um, if you go to my website, there's a blog on there and there's all kinds of articles and advice and, and more mental skills training tools uh, that are on the blog. And you can also sign up for my newsletter and you get monthly mental skills training tips on my newsletter and you get a free um, ebook uh, that's motivation for athletes. Um, you can also connect with me. I'm all over social media. You can connect with me on Facebook and Twitter and get all kinds of tools. There's free downloads on my website. So there's all kinds of great resources for you there. And um, I, and if you haven't gotten my book yet, you should totally get it. <laughs> I'm super pumped up about the book right now because I have my official book launch on Friday. So I'm geeking out about the book. So you can get it right now. If there's a paperback version and a Kindle version, um, you can get it at Amazon. And I, you know, I, I wrote this book for you. I wrote this book because, because it was unbelievably heartbreaking to me to think that there were athletes out there that were contemplating quitting their sport because they couldn't handle the, the anxiety that they felt in preparation for their competition. just don't have these tools to be able to learn how to do it. So I was like, all right, that's it. I'm writing this book. So I really wrote this book for you. It's got amazing mental skills training tools in there for anyone. If you've ever felt like you have been your own biggest obstacle or that you, you know, or if you have an athlete that's struggled with some of these mental blocks, get this book. This is, you know, it's, it's got the, the tools that you need to work on that part of your game. And I'm super stoked to announce last week I launched a brand new online goal setting program. Um, and uh, so that's my big bonus for you guys. I, you know, I just, I love working with Training Peaks and I love working with endurance athletes. And so I wanted to give you guys, a, since it's brand new, I wanted to give you a shot at, um, uh, at checking it out. So I, I created a code for you guys and it's 20% off the online goal setting program. So it basically takes you step by step through you know, through whatever your goal is, no matter what what it is that you're working towards from start to finish, um, from, you know, from really figuring out, am I ready to commit to this goal all the way to accomplishing it? So, you know, I just, I saw so many athletes um, and people in general that, you know, feel like they couldn't wrap their head around goal setting or they would try and accomplish a goal and they, and they didn't do it and then they felt bad about themselves. And I realized, well, they're not, you know, they're not, most of the time they're not failing at their goal, they just aren't using an effective goal setting program. So this just takes you step by step through the whole, like this is what you need to do. <laughs> so use that, if you go check it out, you can go to my website, you can read more about it and check it out. And if you decide to get it, make sure you use that coupon code in um, uh, Training Peaks in the, as you check out. And so let's get to some Q&A. I'd love to hear what questions you have for me. 
Great, Carrie. Thank you. We collected a, a handful of really great questions. So um, we have about 10 minutes to go through some of these. Um, so the first one is, is it generally now held that there's a large genetic component to the ability to suffer? Interviews with some athletes during the Olympics would at least lend some cred uh, credit to that viewpoint. Yeah, that's a great question. And yes, absolutely. So there is um, there is a, a genetic component. So when you, you know, kind of in the beginning I was talking about, you, you see these people that you feel like they were just born to suffer, there is something to that. And there are, um, there, there is a genetic component. So for the rest of us <laughs> that don't necessarily have that genetic component, there are things that we can do to be able for us to push ourselves to whatever our sort of suffering potential is. So for me, that this was a, a, a big one. This, the, um, this was not something that came easy to me to work through, through this. So, um, so there is absolutely um, a, a genetic component that's a, a piece of this. Great, thanks. Um, another question that we actually got a few times is um, in the few hours or the time before prepare, preparing for a big race, why is it that we have to go to the bathroom quite often? <laughs> I know it's not necessarily about suffering, but there's enough people that ask that uh, love to hear your thoughts on Oh, that. that's awesome. It's a, it's a specific kind of suffering, right? The suffer so, um, so this is awesome. So one of the athletes that I had that helped inspire me to write this book that was experiencing pre-performance anxiety before her races, or her, she actually, she was a, um, she was doing uh, water skiing. That was her sport. <laughs> she so her kids would make fun of her because she had to go to the bathroom like three times before her race. So our big victory was that she only had to go twice before her races. <laughs> so your it's an anxiety response. It's just your um your that it's just a normal thing that happens. That's why you see the long lines before your <laughs> competition. So that being said, you know, so one thing is to just like whatever. This my body is getting me ready to compete. That's the way to think about it. It's like I'm just eliminating, so I'm freer to be able to go get into my competition. But you know, there's there are things that you can do to work on managing your anxiety. So maybe you only have to go once instead of going five times before your competition. <laughs> Thanks. Um, okay, the next question. Can you suggest some mantras or other practical methods to help accept the pain? Oh, that's a good, yeah. Um, so when, when it comes to mantras in general or sort of the, the messages that you're giving yourself, so there's two, I have two tips. One is that you want to say what you want versus what you don't want. So our, you know, our, our brain doesn't necessarily process the, the word don't. It, it processes what comes after that. So, you know, for an example right now, don't think about a shark. You can think about anything but a shark. Don't think about a shark. So uh, you probably thought about a shark. You, that's how our brain works. Our brain goes, what am I not supposed to think about? And then you think about that. So, so say stating what you want instead of what you don't want. So you can say, you know, instead of saying, I don't want to feel pain, you're saying, I feel calm, I feel strong, I feel ready. You know, you're saying things that you, as if they're true and things that you want. And then the other thing with mantras is that it, if it's more, if it's something that's personally meaningful to you, it's going to be more powerful. Um, so, so something that that you connect with personally is going to be that's going to be the most powerful thing. But in ad in addition to that, it's you're you're wanting your brain to give your body the message that you're okay, so, and that those are the kinds of mantras that you want. For me, uh, you know, I I, kind of, I said this one already, but a big one for me is every step gets me closer. So it's it's sort of and, and it's personally meaningful for me. So it it has that piece to it and it sends that bigger message of I can do this I'm okay all right uh, the next question is is there sometimes a physical component of pain for instance in an Ironman this person has experienced hyperventilating especially as emotion takes hold they see their family they see their friends and they just want to break down yeah there so with that um, there might be a, a few different, you know, there might be a couple different things that are going on. So there is a, um, you know, when you're, when you get 
uh, emotional and you're sort of overcome with that emotion, it, sometimes the, um, you know, and, I, and I'm not sure exactly what they're asking, but, the, but sometimes you're going to feel it really big in that moment. So what happens is it's almost like your, your brain kind of compartmentalizes. So you, you're, you have this ability to kind of hold on to a certain point and then when you see, you know, especially when you get to the end of a big race and it's a huge accomplishment for you, as soon as you see that person that loves you, it's like a huge release. It's that you, then you can just let go. Um, and, and so that's sometimes where that, that physical um, response comes from. It's this, your brain was sort of like, I'm holding it, I'm going to hold it all together and I'm, and I'm right here in it and then you're, you see that person that you love and it kind of breaks out of that that compartmentalization and you feel it all in that moment so that's sometimes that's what's going on when when you experience something like that all right thanks um, I think we have time for just a couple more questions and this one probably not for you Carrie since you're um, in California but I know for us in Colorado <laughs> and the folks in Chicago um, do you have any tips or tricks for getting past the hump while with that and that's um, you know there's a lot of different things that people and you've probably tried all these too there's a lot of different things that people will use so some um, some people will do you know that you can do too and or you just you know, use that idea of distraction and watch a movie so there's you know there's different things that that you can um, do in that way and then for some people that are just miserable and they really have a hard time with it have them work with their coaches and figure out well is there any way for us to break up some of the training um, and still achieve the result that you want so you know so so think outside of the box a little bit too um, especially if you're if you get to the point where it's like I can't handle the thought of of getting on my trainer again so I'm not going to do it okay if you're not going to do it what's the next best thing that's going to help you you know can you break it up into you know do two days or you know so kind of working with your your coach on that um, but another thing that can be beneficial too is to whatever that end goal is to have that visually up somewhere wherever your trainer is or or your treadmill to you know to be able to have that somewhere where you see it and you look at it and you know I'm doing this for that I'm doing this because I'm working towards that so being able to make that immediate decision based on the bigger goal sometimes having that visual there will will help you because if you don't have that if you're not able to connect to it in that moment and all you think is if I have to run on the treadmill again I want to kill myself then you're not gonna you know, you're you're gonna go with that immediate perceived reward of not running on the treadmill so you you want to connect it with that bigger goal okay thanks um, I think we have time for just one more question and this one I think um, is regarding that critical moment on the marathon portion of an Ironman once I let myself walk a little it becomes easy to continue to let myself resign the fact that I'm gonna walk and walk more and more and more how can I break that cycle? And I think that, you know, it sounds very specific for that person, but I know this is a pretty common thing that happens with um, Ironman athletes. Yeah, that is, um, I've, I've worked on that with athletes. So it's, you know, part, part of that is that you're, you've, you know, when we talked about, especially when it comes to suffering, and that, I mean, that's such a great example, is that we, we can mediate it. We can mediate the feeling of suffering by, not pushing as hard so you know and that's a great example of I walk and now all I can do is walk I don't want to run anymore so so there you know and I this is a, a great question for your coaches too but you know I don't I, I'm not an expert on the, the physiological piece but I know for some of my athletes they have a there's a, a time limit to where you, they know if I walk for X amount of time and start running again I'm fine I can do it but if I start walking and I go for a little bit longer my body it's harder for my body to get started again so not just the physical you're not just the mental piece but the physical piece so knowing that about yourself um, and what that marker is so some for some athletes they'll set sort of rules for themselves of like 
it, I don't care what's happening, you have to, you know, after one minute, you have to start running again, or so you kind of do those things for yourself. But that does become a critical moment where if you are feeling that, if you're feeling compelled to walk and you know once you walk that's it you're not going to keep going some of the tools of picking that next marker or um, or knowing what do I need to say to myself in that moment in order to get through that moment because sometimes that's it sometimes it's just getting through the moment where you want to stop um, and instead you know it's a, a little bit of um, of, of, of emotion control and and being able to hold on through that moment of discomfort, sometimes that's enough to get through it. Um, so knowing, well, what is your, when you have the moment where you want to walk, having a rule for yourself of, I have to run for another two minutes, and then I can decide. And then at that two minutes, you go, okay, I can run two more minutes, and then I'll decide. So you, you know, you make it a little bit smaller. But knowing, you know, having that plan in place ahead of time is huge for that for that moment. The other thing for some people that really struggle with this, sometimes it's, um, it's a, this is such a good one, it's such a great question. Sometimes planning the walk can help as well. This doesn't work for everybody, so you kind of have to know, you have to play with it, and you have to know how you operate. But for some people, when, once they say to themselves, that's part of their plan, that's part of their game plan, is I'm going to walk the aid stations, or I'm going to you know, whatever it is, it then becomes um, acceptable and a part of their game plan and part of the game plan is already written in there that I'm going to walk and then I'm going to run. So sometimes ha you know, just creating that in your game plan can help as well. Thanks Carrie. Um, so that's all the time we have today. I just want to remind everybody that we are recording this and we'll send an email out to everyone and let you know once it's ready to go. But you can also take a look at our YouTube channel. We've got a Training Peaks Dot com YouTube, YouTube channel out there and we have a webinar playlist so you can also go back and you can watch the first webinar that Carrie did with us so with that I want to thank you Carrie for um, doing the webinar and providing this awesome information and I want to thank everyone for attending and taking some time out of your day thank you have a great day <laughs>